back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. All of our wise conversations can be found out in our audio vault on all of our social media. And, of course, uh, we've gotten back to doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. Got a new date on our mayor, Brandon Scott. We'll be doing that now in November. We'll be telling you more about that. We're at Mother's this week, and I put together half of Federal Hill on short notice to do that. You can find that in the uh, Baltimore Positive repository as well. We're going to get back to Fadley soon and the State Fair. I'm setting all that stuff up right now. Uh, Don Moeller and I are still a little bit in a state of shock uh, after the death of uh, Ted Venetoulis, but we're uh, forging through here. You can hear our thoughts on that, so we're not going to tackle that in this one. Instead, we're going to stick to the script and the schedule here, Don, and bring in an old friend of yours. And, you know, I love when this guy comes on because we used to do radio back in the day. Some guys would have the ballpark report in the phone. They'd say, there's a lot of noise behind me. I'm like, it gives authenticity to it. So where Luke Broadwater is sitting right now, Don, you know that seat. This is the, one of the great views of Baltimore positive past and present and future, right? Say, so, yeah, he found a little cubby. You found a little cubby hole over there somewhere on the Capitol Hill, right, Luke? That's right. They said that there are these phone booths in the Senate that you could use to make calls and not uh, – give up your scoops to the other uh, reporters. So that's, well, see, that's well, I don't get fake backgrounds. Like this is, this is like, I really live here. This is a real picture, but this isn't real. Like I can't touch it. Right. But, like you're really in a phone booth. Oh, I mean, really? that's a, uh, room yeah, waiter gives that a 10. Uh, I'm got all right the now. numbers of all the senator's offices. If you want to call <laughs> him. He, can, he can go full Clark Kent on us. Well, Luke, welcome. <laughs> welcome back to Baltimore positive. Hey, before we get in, and we're going to give you a, a tall, tall order this morning. We're going to say, all right, Luke Broadwater, make sense of what the hell's going on down there. But before we do that, you've now been with the Times. What have you been, about a year, Luke? <laughs> I've been a little more than a year. A little I more than a year. Of last year, yeah. A okay, little more than a year you've been with the New York Times. Now that you look back, t- t- we have a lot of folks who really like journalism, and they, this would be a way to honor our good friend Ted Venetoulos because he loved journalism. What's the same and what's different? What's the same about being a reporter for the Times as it was when you were with the Sun or a smaller paper? And what's different? That's a good question. I mean, the, the fundamentals of journalism are the same, right? It's, you know, tr- try to find out facts that people <laughs> um, didn't know about, try to reveal something that, uh, you know, the public didn't know. Um, but also, um, you know, relay the facts in a very even handed and fair way, not don't try to put opinion into things, just, um, you know, so the, the, the building blocks are the same, the fundamentals are the same. Um, but the, I guess what's really different is, you know, I mean, they're very different missions of the two papers. I mean, the, the Baltimore Sun is dedicated, you know, uh, to holding local and state governments accountable, to letting informing readers about what's happening in local and state governments. And at least with the kind of reporting I was doing at the paper, obviously there's the sports section and the business section. This is where I come like, in and say healthy and Holly and, <laughs> and, and, oh, and by the way, uh, Larry Hogan's buddy down there this week too. So we'll, yeah, we'll, throw remind- that, we'll throw that in, but this is how this stuff happens, bro. You know, to honor Ted Benetoulos and, you know, and journalist and what I have done for a living my whole life, which is trying to figure out where the truth is, you know? And I, and I, I, I love that you say, just not take a side, not be, but then there's the point where you're being lied to and parroted it out that our jobs have become different, man. All of us, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, you, it's an interest. It's always a dilemma for the journalist because you start off in a place where you want to be very fair and you want to uh, treat every, every party of a story, even handedly. Um, but then at some point, um, especially if there's someone lying in the story or if, someone's you know trying to spin or steer in a way that's just not true you have to also be the referee right you have to call things out and say actually that's wrong that's a lie those facts are so you have to do both you can't just parrot what the person says and create a false sense of balance in the middle don was a high school principal don tell luke what you would always say when people come in i love the principal molar speech about (laughs) Don't lie to me. I mean, it's almost like um, the Fox. Well, right? Refresh my memory. I have so many. What did I say? No, you you would say, 
I, well, I'll, I'll do anything you want, but but you can't lie to me. Oh to, yeah, to don't a kid lie when to he comes me. in. Yeah, don't lie to me. Well, I used to say, and it's and it's probably similar to journalism, Luke. The truth's eventually going to come out, right? I mean, Woodward and Costa are going to write a book, and the truth's going to be in there, and it's going to be backed up by facts. And the bottom line is, I would say to kids all the time, don't lie to me because, and certainly don't lie to your mom and dad because when they come in. <laughs> They're going to find out the truth. And if you've told them something other, they're going to be even less happy. And I had more than one parent, you know, grab their kid by their hair and say, all right, we're done here because the kid wasn't telling the truth. But so in the midst of all that, is, is there do you feel more is there more competition, Luke? Um, I, I love the discussion. And this is really sort of a, so I said uh, coming about because my thinking so much about Ted today. Is there more competition at the times to write a story that might be worthy of page one? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, obviously, I mean, the New York Times has 1,700 journalists. So it's, you know, I mean, I get on the front page a fair amount, but, you know, I mean, you're, you know, there's amazing stories coming out of China and Africa and, you know, all over the world, you know, th th there's been a lot of coverage of the election in Germany recently. So yeah, you have a much, it's, it's a lot harder to get on the front page as a reporter. Right. And actually I've always thought as a reporter, you shouldn't really think about that. You shouldn't try to get on the front page or write the, the, the most exciting story. You should just follow the facts where they lead. Sometimes that leads to a boring story and it ends up in the back of the paper. And sometimes that le leads to a dynamite story. So you don't you know, obviously it's nice to be on the front page, but your goal is to do the fundamentals well, to hold people accountable and keep the public informed. And, um, you know, the, the big difference with the New York Times is just, I mean, it's, it's just a huge publication. It's an international publication. There's, there's a ton of resources. And also I'm covering something that's much more, not that there wasn't competition for city government news and Maryland state politics news, but, um, it's a, it's a very competitive beat. There's just, you know, this place is teeming with reporters, just dozens well, and dozens of them. So you, you have to, to like break a story here. You have a lot more competition. Well, let's pick up on that because you and dozens and dozens, as you say, of journalists are tracing one of the most, I want to say complex stories in government and, and I like to think of myself as a, as a, a mini government junkie, so to speak, try to understand how it works, ins and outs. And Luke, this, what we've got going on now with, with debt ceiling, infrastructure bill, reconciliation, progressives, moderates, right-wingers, Republicans, Democrats, Mitch, Schumer, I, I, I mean... You, you you can't tell the players without a scorecard. So we're we're going to try to have you make some sense out of what's going on. Let me start with an easy. Can you explain to our listeners as if they were fifth graders what in the heck the debt ceiling even is? Sure. Well, Congress sets a sp sets a spending limit in law, and you can't <laughs> um, create more debt than the limit. Um, now, what happens is, and this happens quite frequently, is the United States government spends um, money and then in incurs the debt and then will have to reauthorize and raise the debt limit to pay for it. It's usually a very bipartisan thing. There's some economists who don't think there should be a debt limit, um, but this year it's being used as a political cudgel. Um, and so Republicans right now are withholding their support, or they were at least. Um, I don't know what will happen by the time the <laughs> listeners hear this, but, um, but we're withholding their support to raise the debt limit and using that as a, the threat of default, which has never happened in American history and would have catastrophic impact um, as a political weapon against the Democrats to try to yield concessions on other topics. And so that's, that's what's going on right now. The, the debt limit used to be bipartisan. It used to be the type of thing that everyone could agree, oh, we owe this money, well, we should pay our debts. 
Um, but right now it's, it's being used as part of a political game. And I think that yeah. most people think that's kind of disgusting. I mean, it was raised 18 times under Reagan, eight under Clinton, you know, seven under Bush, five under Obama. I mean, it's, it's never been an issue. I, I guess the bigger question, Luke, for our listeners and for, for Nestor and me is why isn't there a more serious effort to simply do away with the debt limit, with the understanding, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, the debt limit isn't tied to new spending. The debt limit is used to pay for what the government has already appropriated. So it's like if if Nestor goes out or you go out and buy a new car today, you've you've agreed to pay for that car. You you shouldn't have to decide every month whether you want to make that payment. And it, and it seems to me that to have Congress want to do this, regardless of which party is in power, seems to me it would be a benefit to both parties to say, let's get rid of the debt limit and just agree that whatever we owe, we have to pay. Why is that so complicated? Well, there's been some talk about uh, raising the debt limit to some astronomical number so it wouldn't have to be this sort of annual or you know, frequent thing that that Congress encounters. Um, I guess in theory, the the idea of the debt limit was to was to keep spending low, and to um, you know, so people would be aware of the debt limit and not and and keep spending more in check. But the 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 function of it actually is that it's never thought about um, until the moment we're about to <laughs> come up against default, and then and then there's always a well, then there's always, and then it becomes a bargaining chip, right? Like right. D- d- depending on who's in the minority, or Joe Manchin yeah. or Kristen Cinema. I-, I wanted to ask you about them and Mitch McConnell, sort of the key players in all of this, because you do ask the questions down there. McConnell is, you know, when we're saying lying, um, changing things all the time, it's a big shell game, and then it does come down to the media to have to say, is it this or that, or are you lying? Um, I don't get that out of it, but but when it comes to these key times and he's standing there sort of holding the cards on the red side of the table, um, that's when this thing gets even more complex and more unlike, quite frankly, the way our government worked the first 230 years or so. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, this is sort of unprecedented what's going on right now. The um, We've never had a default. Um, I don't, I don't, actually don't think we'll end up in default. I think that there will be uh, either an agreement or that Democrats will just find a way to do it alone. Um, the, the issue here for the Republicans is that they are opposed to President Biden's broader agenda, which is this, you've probably heard about it, the Build Back Better plan, which has, it's so wide ranging that um, uh, it, it, it's hard to even describe in a few sentences, but it's everything from like pre-K funding, community college funding, child care tax credit. Why can't the um, Democrats get a name like the New Deal and make that? You know what I mean? Why can't yeah. they brand this in some way other than this shit's going to cost a lot of money? I mean, that, that's what <laughs> this is, you know, literally. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it is so it's so expansive that it's it is hard to, as and people complain a lot. Well, the, the media doesn't tell you everything that's in it. Well, that's because there's so much stuff in it. But the so I I try, I try to do that whenever I talk about this stuff. But it's how you much know, it's, is it's, in it? If we sat and read it, is is it, like literally how much is in it for a journalist I or think, anybody to I, read? Well, the bill's always the bill's not finished yet, but I believe it clocked in at over two thousand pages. Fair enough. So yeah, um, the but so other things that are in it, which I, I like to remind everybody of is expanding uh, Medicare to um, cover hearing, dental, vision, lowering the age on um, when people can get benefits. Uh, there's so many there's so many things that are part of the democratic agenda that have been put into this plan. And basically Mitch McConnell saying, I don't want any of that stuff. I want you guys to drop the entire plan and then I will agree to vote, have the Republicans vote to raise the debt limit so we don't default. That's basically what's going on. And the Democrats are like, no, this is our whole agenda. This is what President Biden stands for. You should, 
uh, give us the votes to to raise this limit because it's a responsible thing. Um, <laughs> and so the two sides have been at loggerheads. Uh, it does seem like we're going to have a temporary reprieve and this will just come up again in December and we'll pick up this fight again around the holidays. But um, those are kind of the two sides at play here. The, the, the advantage, the leverage that the Democrats have though is Mitch McConnell cannot stand the idea of weakening or getting rid of the filibuster. Right. And uh, that's the mechanism that slows down most bills from passing or blocks. Most yeah, we've talked at length about the filibuster. It's sort of, that sort of comes and goes. These things sort of come yeah. and, they, and they go and it, it gets, let. but, but that would, that is, that's the red button, right? For, for everyone right. in all of this, right? And so when President Biden um, recently said he would consider a carve out to the filibuster for the debt limit, then you saw McConnell back down immediately and and say, well, we could do a temporary deal. So, I mean, so that's that's sort of the Democrats' Trump card against McConnell. The problem is they need all 50 senators to vote for any change to the filibuster rules, and that's that's also hard to come by because of the people you just mentioned, Manchin. Well, let's, 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 let's talk word, about... Smith, we're not going to use the word Trump card anymore. I think it's taken a whole different... <laughs> oh, sorry, like, did you, I say you know, Trump we, card? We, yeah, you did, and, and it's, <laughs> the, I mean, it's the right word, but we need to talk to Webster and Roger about maybe... Yeah. That yeah. probably has a different meaning. Coming up now. with it a new a word. Meaning, well, let, let's talk about the players down there, Luke, because it's got to be maybe you can shed some light on it i always say that if ever there was it was that old adage that my friends remind me all the time when will rogers said i'm not the member of any organized democratic part i mean any, any organized political party i'm a democrat you know and that's more true today <laughs> when you try to be a big tent i mean that tent can get pretty raucous and you've got you know, the progressive caucus in the House. And what do you put their numbers, Luke? Somewhere between 40 and 50 or a little higher? Oh, no, the progressives are up to uh, 95 members in the House now. They're almost half of House Democrats. OK, so, so 90, 95. They're the biggest, are, most powerful block in the in the um, in the House. Led by Pramila Jepal. And are they pretty unified in, in terms of, I, I guess what I wanted to ask you to talk about, we love the speaker, obviously the speaker from Baltimore, and she's ruled with an iron hand forever. Are we seeing some cracks in that wall in that the speaker's not at this point as skilled and gifted as she is, is not quite able to get this group to march in lockstep as they have in the past? Well, it's interesting because, you know, everyone on the Hill believes that Nancy Pelosi will bring this thing home. I mean, <laughs> that's like a pervasive belief that, um, yes, she has to deal with these multitude of factions. You have the progressives who are almost 100 strong. And then you have some of the centrist Democrats who, you know, even if there's only 10 of them, um, they can kill the bill. So they've got to get everybody on board. And almost everybody says no one else could do this job but her, that, that she's the only person that can do it. Um, there was a bit of a hiccup recently when they tried to pass the infrastructure bill and the votes couldn't materialize because of different holdouts. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think the conventional wisdom and the, the, the good money is that eventually there will be a deal. Both bills will pass, the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better bill, and Nancy Pelosi will take a victory lap. But I mean, I could it's, be wrong. Well, <laughs> no, what, I, I, I mean, I, listen, I wouldn't hold you to yeah. that because this is a hard one to predict. Is Dutch, I mean, Dutch certainly isn't one of the 95 in the progressive caucus. Is, is Does Dutch meet or caucus with the, the blue dogs or the moderates down there? Where, where, do, where does Dutch fit in in this? Uh, I see he's a confidant of the speaker. Yeah, he's, he's more of the, what I, I don't know if the right words like mainstream Democrats, but he's, you know, the he's the the Nancy Pelosi votes. So he right. he's going to support the speaker's agenda. Um, you know, he's not going to get at, out too. He, you know, he is more of a centrist lawmaker, but he's not one of the disruptive centrists who would um, throw throw a monkey wrench in the speaker's plans and 
you know, threatening to blow up the deal, which some of them are doing, some of the centrists are doing. So yeah, they're being pretty, um, vo- pretty, pretty vocal uh, on that. That's why I said, and you're right. She's probably the only one with the skills to, to bring this home. T- tell our listeners, Luke, because you cover both sides of the, of the, the chamber down there. What's, what's the difference for you guys and, and women who cover the Senate every day What's the difference between cinema and mansion? Um, well, they're both centrists, but they have very different um, uh, styles and they have very different electorates. So Joe Manchin, as everybody knows, is, is you know, billed as the most conservative Democrat in the Senate. He comes from West Virginia, which voted for Trump by like 40 points. So most Democrats consider it a miracle that they even have a Democrat vote from West Virginia. And it's it's constantly on everyone's minds that if it not, not for Manchin, they would have no chance of passing much of their agenda because there would just be a Republican there. Um, and Joe Manchin can be hard to understand sometimes. He sometimes speaks in riddles, um, but the he is generally pretty vocal about what he wants. He'll come out, I'll talk to the press. He'll say, I want 1.5 trillion, not 3.5 trillion. Um, he say, he'll say X, Y, and Z are my demands, and they can negotiate with them. Kirsten Cinema from Arizona is a little bit more frustrating for Democrats because, um, one, she's from a state that votes for, Dem- votes for Democrats. So there's no, there's not a, she doesn't have a deep red voting base that she's got to make happy, right? And so when she holds up their plans, they get even more angry. Um, and the other thing is she always says she won't negotiate in public. So many times people try to talk to her and understand her positions and you can't understand what's, what her it point It feels is. like she doesn't understand her own positions. It, 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 you know what I'm saying? It feels to me like the job's big for some of these people, um, including the idiot that ran the country for four years that didn't understand much of what his job was or pol- anything. She feels to me to be like in over her head – from a from an understanding standpoint yeah i don't know because she never because she won't discuss in public what she wants it's hard to know know what her whole i wonder how these people get elected i really do like they're just across the wide spectrum of the showboating gates and these people like just who goes in and votes for these ted cruz running off to cancun just on on integrity issues alone it's it's amazing but then on policy when you have to sit there and ask them a question and you wonder like i never sit in front of a football coach and wonder if they know football i I really don't (laughs) well unfortunately we have a trend I, i don't know if this is true for kirsten cinema because I do hear I, we, we rely on like leaks for what she wants from like the different people she's negotiating with. But, you know, you do sit down with some of these lawmakers and it's very clear they have no grasp of policy. They have no agenda. It, their agenda is merely getting on TV and causing a whole lot of drama and trouble. Um, you know, they're, you know, famously the, one of the new congressmen in the Republican Party from North Carolina, Madison Cawthorn, told his uh staff they weren't interested in policy they were interested in communications so they're you know they're he's you know trying to be a star he throw you know right-wing bombs at people and i mean unfortunately that's the game for a lot of these congress people the goal for them luke right is to see if they can say something that gets them on hannity that night or Tucker yeah Carlson. absolutely yeah i mean that's absolutely. The, that's that's I mean, there really forward. is no meat on the bone in many, you know, there's a gun on the wall in some cases in Colorado, but there's no real moving forward of the people. And that feels like it comes from one side, which is people say, why do you vote that way? Well, they talk about helping people that that literally and I don't hear that on the other side. That's what I'm talking about with Mitch McConnell. Like, it's not just a portrayal. It's just sort of a roadblock. It doesn't feel like there's anything that that moves moves policy on that side it just feels like a game of blocking and show and i guess that's the frustrating part for a citizen who just sends people down there hey you're in better shape there wasn't an insurrection this week and you're hiding in the booth like the last time we got together right yeah i mean you know your points are are true that there there is sadly a, a, a not small portion of congress which has no idea what about any policy and um, is, you know, is, is playing this other kind of game. Um, 
and and, I, and it's, it really is infecting the Republican Party more than the Democratic Party. I mean, people like to compare the far right to the squad, but the squad actually has like policy goals and legislation. And yeah, they are on the far left of the Democratic Party. And many of the mainline Democrats don't agree with their positions. But there's actually a policy agenda there, whereas on the far right, it's unclear what the policy agenda is other than, um, you know, dunking on people on on cable news. So. No, no, that, I think I, I think that's really a critical uh, distinction that you make. I, I make that one all of the time, Luke, that you can you can be critical of the squad's proposals. You can take on Elon Omar or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and say you don't agree, but they're at least putting out proposals that you can take issue with. You don't get that from the other side. Listen, you've been gracious with your time. You got work to do. How does this end up? Uh, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and we'll come back and see how accurate we were. First of all, when, by what point in time will we have both an infrastructure bill and a reconciliation bill? What point will we have it by Halloween? I'm going to make a prediction that it's at the end of the year, it's in December. Um, I think that the Democrats realize they can't let this go into 2022, that if they do that, the political, because we're coming up on an election year, the politics get too crazy. They need to get, get it done this year. Um, I predict the Build Back Better bill shrinks substantially, maybe down to close to Manchin's number because they need his vote so badly. Does, does it shrink, Luke? But are you hearing rumblings down there that the progressives would be willing, and it makes some sense to me, to shrink it by cutting it from 10 to five, six or seven years yeah. with the That's belief the that once, American, like. once the American public gets these entitlements, it's going to be difficult to take them away. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, the Progressive Caucus would like that. It, it also has the benefit of being very simple. <laughs> Rather than going through and cutting right. this out or that out, you just cut 10 10 years to five years, and now you're at 1.75. Um, so the, I've actually- Is Manchin, is Manchin that. okay with that? So the, the, Manchin, there are certain things Manchin doesn't like in the bill. And so I think he's going to demand some of those come out. He's concerned about the, the fiscal health of Medicare. And so he doesn't want to expand it to vision and dental and hearing. Um, he has a number of other demands so he it's amazing call. when you think about that like i i just hearing a reporter say we don't do dental or eye or like none of that's like human you, know, you can live without those things we'll just <laughs> my mother was 98 years old like that that is that's anti-human policy really kind of sort of right yeah and senator bernie sanders really went after him yesterday he was like point of the things in the bill you want to cut from you know cut senator mansion uh point you know do you not want people to have health care? Do you not want people to have child care? Like he, so he was blind you know, really deaf people them. eating pudding. Right, exactly. And jello. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, you know, I, I think there will be a deal eventually. I predict there will be this the end of this year, and I, it'll be much smaller than what President Biden wanted. But I, I really think they can't let it roll into next year. And if they do, it's going to be even riskier to get a deal because once you get into election season, it starts to get this place becomes even crazier than it is right now. So um, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Last question, Luke. What's the sense down there um, in the cloakrooms and in the gyms of what's going to happen in 2022? Who, who's going to have the upper hand? What, what are both sides of the aisle feeling about 22? I mean, the conventional wisdom down here, almost everybody thinks the Republicans are going to take the House. And that's for a number of reasons. One, um, there's a historical trend that the president's party loses seats in the um, off-year election. It's been that way most elections. Um, so there's that. The Democrats only have um, a few seats to spare. But the probably the bigger thing is that there's redistricting going on and that because Republicans control more states than Democrats at the state level, it's why they believe they will redistrict in their favor heavily. And so that redistricting alone, just gerrymandering the seats to put more Republicans in, will give them the advantage, even if 
let's say Democrats do better than expected on election day and buck the historical trend against the against the president. So it really could be just gerrymandering alone gives the Republicans the House. And that's why you see so much pressure to pass Joe Biden's agenda before 2022. So the bottom line is, Nestor, if you want to know to our listeners what's going on, the best reporting coming out of D.C. today, get a subscription to The New York Times, jump on time, jump online, read Luke Broadwater uh, by way of the Baltimore Sun, by way of Homehurst Avenue, by way of McDonough <laughs> School to The New York Times. Uh, read Luke Broadwater. That's how you know what's happening in Washington, D.C. Look, you depressed the hell out of me about everything down there. I just want to say, like, yak off, smear off. When you gave me all of that, I'm like, what a country. We, we, we ended it on, <laughs> we're going to gerrymander. They're going to do what the hell they want anyway because they're corrupt. <laughs> and back to you, Ness. I appreciate that. <laughs> Luke, stay safe down there, uh, and uh, we'll continue to root the Ravens home here, and uh, and uh, and we'll hope to come down and say hello sometime soon. They're looking good. I, they're looking I, good I hear so the uh, congressional That's crab cake is delicious, according to Donna Edwards. So I, I need to figure <laughs> that out down there, all right? Okay. That's Thanks, great. Luke. Thanks, Luke guys. Water, New York it. Times of Baltimore and of the Baltimore Sun. Always great to visit with an award-winning journalist and spend some time uh, down on the hill, as they say, in safe quarters. Uh, Don and I will be getting back out to State Fair and to Fadley's. I'm wearing the Fadley shirt here. I'll be getting down there for the big crab cakes. You'll see me eating them online. Uh, the Maryland Crab Cake Tour is moving around. It's all presented by the Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. Mothers in Federal Hill this week on short notice. We'll be back at Coco's next month with our mayor, Brandon Scott. We have a new date set for that in the middle of November. I'll be telling you more about that. On behalf of former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller, I am Nestor Aparicio. And with heavy hearts, uh, we honor Ted Venatoulis, our favorite publisher and media maven and tycoon on his passing here this week. And his wife, Lynn, it's been a... uh, I mean, it's off week for Baltimore Positive around here. We'll uh, we'll send it out. And if you want to hear from Ted, there's a whole bunch of stuff up at Baltimore Positive. Uh, I'll be sharing some stuff out on social media. I'm sure uh, words will be pouring in from lots and lots of places about the life and times of Ted Venatoulis. I'm Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570. Towson, like the Towson Times, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore Positive.